Further, I just want to give some extra guidance and support for the, uh, the risk assessment for the NG2 unit. Um, this can be um, quite difficult for some, some learners because they, they may be, make some common mistakes. So I just want to go step by step through the risk assessment and just see if we can help you avoid them. OK, so what I'm going to do, this is the sample risk assessment, and I'm going to go line by line through the risk assessment, all four sections of it, and just give that a little bit of extra guidance and just give you a little bit more of an indication of what the marker's looking for. So to do this, we're going to compare this against the marker's guide. So this is the actual marker's guide that the marker would use to, to score your risk assessment. So each of these white, white lines here, uh, next to it, they would be able to put whether that, that particular category has been met or not met. So all of these white lines need to be need to be met or you would unfortunately refer on the risk assessment. So it's not scored in any way. It's purely down to you, you either meet the requirements or you don't. OK, so first things first, we'll do the first section, which is part one, which is the background of the organisation. It does have a, a word count here. Don't, don't worry about that too much if you do go over. That's simply there because there's thousands of risk assessments and a certain number of markers. So they don't want people to go to go overboard and maybe do six or seven pages for something when all they're looking for is, is roughly around 200 words. Okay, name of the organization is simply that. Just pop your name of your organization in there. The site location, uh, in the sample, they've just put the area, but for me, I would put a little bit more detail in there. So maybe put, you know, the full site address. I understand some organizations can't do that because the site generally may be security concerns. So you can put a fictional one in there and maybe put in brackets, site fictional due to security concerns, and that would be fine. Okay, number of workers, they've just put a number there. Um, I don't think it would hurt to put a little bit more detail, uh, maybe break that down into different types of workers. Uh, as an example, you maybe put 150 admin staff, yeah, etc. So maybe just put a little bit more information in there. That couldn't hurt. <clears throat> okay, general description of the organization. Uh, so you, in this, you, you want to basically um, a full description of what that company does. So the actions that they do every day, um, the, the types of you know, challenges, what they what they service they provide, what, what, if they manufacture anything. Uh, and also you'll notice on the markers guide, it gives a little bit more of an indication here. So products manufactured, services provider, types of activities and shift patterns. Now that's really important because sometimes people miss shift patterns off. It doesn't have to be massively detailed, but you do need to include the shift patterns that people do. You can break this down into different different types of workers if you want. So, or if, it, if the building just open nine while five and that's when people work, that's fine as well. But just put a little information in there. Again, don't go overboard and do you know, three, 400 words on that. It's, it's, it's around this level of detail that we're looking for. You just need to include what shift patterns people are doing and what's, what's being done every day by the organization, what activities are being carried out on a daily basis. Okay, description of the area to be included in the risk assessment. Now, this here is not very detailed at all in the sample, but what you need to be thinking about is, is maybe the layout of the building. Just, again, not, not massively detailed, just um, a, a really good description of, of what that building looks like. So say, say it's uh, on three floors, um, what each floor does. Um, so you need to think about fire provisions, um, you know, fire exits, reception, break rooms, toilet facilities, you know, restaurants, that kind of thing. Just give a, a description of, of the general layout. Again, you don't have to go into too much detail, but just a really good description of, of the layout of the building would be great. Any other relevant information? Yeah, for this, um, it's really anything relevant that you can think of that's not been included in this, this area here. Okay. Okay, so in this section here, Again, they're giving you another 200 words for this. So this would literally be um, how you did the risk assessment. So obviously most people would just put in there that they, they did a walk around and did a dynamic risk assessment. That's fine. But you also need to consider as well, as you learn from the course content, who you need to who you need to speak to, what documentation you need to look at. So it does give you a good idea here. So you need to think about things like risk assessments that have been previously done. Um, accident reports, accidents log, accident investigations, near miss reports, speak to people as well. So you could speak to HR, line managers, staff, and, and maybe get some information from those sources that that maybe give you an indication of any kind of hazards that have 
that have come up in the past that you, you need to look at. So you would need to do just a, a full description here of, of the information that you've looked at to complete the risk assessment. That's what they're looking for. Okay, part two. So this is the actual risk, risk assessment section that people tend to, uh, to struggle on. Okay, so it consists of these columns. So you need to make sure for each. So if I go through, through one and then you can duplicate it for the others. But if we look at this information here that I, I popped on the learning portal for everyone, this is in the books, but it's, it's buried away in all that other information. So I wanted to just to try and make it a little bit clearer because uh, this is an area where people tend to refer the most. So you need to have 10 hazards in total over five categories. So the categories are actually the elements of the NG2 syllabus. So as you can see here, so you need at least five of these and 10 of these hazards from five of these elements here. So as you can see, some of the categories only have maybe one, but then others have quite a few. So you would just need to pick out 10, or I would, I would even go further than that, maybe 12. So pick out 11, 12 of these from five or maybe even six categories just to be on the safe side. So you can see here that the uh, in the sample they've actually put the category here which is really good you should definitely do that and also uh, they've put the hazard now ha the hazard's really good because they've put dust and they've given a hyphen and then a little bit of a description of why that hazard needs to be looked at um sometimes learners may put risks in there by mistake that's a common problem so they may put electrocution or or something like that and obviously that's that's a risk and not a hazard and the marker will pick you up on that so what you need to do is think about the hazard itself or, and also just label it correctly as well so if you were to put fire door you know the markers the marker is going to uh, pick that up because you know if you were to put blocked fire door then that's the hazard the fire door is just an object so you need to make sure that you, you label these these really well in this format really good so if you try and stick to what this sample's done here that's really good Okay, who might be harmed and how? Um, this section I would try and make it a little bit clearer for the marker. So you could literally put the word who, stick it in bold, then underneath it, just list everyone that you can think of that may be affected by that hazard. So it could be um, staff, contractors, visitors, general public, anyone, anyone you can think of. And that can just be bullet point listed. It doesn't have to be written as a, a narrative like that. And then how, you need to think about how someone could be affected by that. So you could literally write the word how, stick it in bold, and then underneath it, give a description of, a more detailed description of, of the hazard and how people could be harmed by it. And then maybe even do a, a bullet point list of different injuries they could sustain from that. And that will give the marker just a really clear indication that you understand that column. Okay, what are you currently doing? It's simple, simple enough, really. So what are you currently doing as far as you're aware? Um, and just, just pop that in there. And then what further controls and actions are required? So this is quite a challenging one. So you need to think about what, what needs to be done to, to, to lower that risk using the hierarchy of control that's been discussed in the course. So you can, I, I would do exactly what this person's done here. So you would list them and just try and make it so they, they make sense and they're doing the real world and you can actually do it. Um, and then put some realistic timescales in there. I've, I've had people referred before because the timescales they've put in there don't really make sense. Like an example may be that they have to resurface the entire car park and they, they maybe put a month in for the timescale for that, which is showing that in the real world is, is not really, it's not really an adequate amount of time to do that. So the marker will pick up on stuff like that. So just make sure that you do that. And please don't put in this box, don't put no action required because you'll be referred straight away for that. Because if you've identified a hazard, what's already being done, then you need to put some reasonable control measures in there on top of what's already been done. And then responsible persons um, is literally anyone that's involved in these actions. So it could be um, directors, health and safety manager, HR, line managers. You just need to pop them in there. And, um, and I, I can see here that they've, they put the action number in. You don't really need to do that, but you can if you'd like. And you just need to put their name and their job title. And then you do the same thing. So across all these columns for the 10 hazards across the five categories, all the way down until you've you've done the same thing for each for each row. And that's, that's simply that really. You just need to make sure you follow those 
you follow those simple um, those simple rules when you're doing that. So just line, just row by row, just go down and make sure that all the information is relevant and, and correct, and that you're following this here, 10 hazards from these five categories. This is on the learning platform. So if you log in, you can see this and refer to it. Okay, part three um, is about prioritizing three actions uh, and justify them. So this is your opportunity to, to highlight the actions that you've chosen and, and why, why you need to do what you need to do to, to control them. I would personally choose maybe three at a higher risk or high severity actions that you've put in there, just because you've got more to talk about if you do that. Um, so what you need to do is the, the first section is, so for all these actions, what are the moral, legal, and financial arguments for doing that? So this one's pretty straightforward. I mean, the sample does give a, a pretty good example of that, what you should be doing anyway. But this is all in the first section of the NG1 book. So you can, um, you can use that information to complete that pretty easily. Uh, so justification, you would have to justify three of your actions in detail. This is really your opportunity to, to, to show why you should do what you've said you would need to do in, in, in section two. Okay, so first of all, give a more detailed description of the action of what you're doing to control that, uh, that hazard and the risks involved. Okay, a specific legal argument. Okay, so this would be, again, from the moral, legal and financial side of things. So this is, so legally what you would need to do, you can quote regulations in here, which are all in your book. And also you can look at the HSE website to get more details on, the, on those and just give a really good description of, of why you should legally do what you're doing. Okay, considerations for likelihood and severity. You can notice here that the, this, in the sample, they've, they've put the words, likelihood and severity in bold just to make it clear to the marker that's what they're that's what they're talking about i would definitely do that so start with likelihood you need to talk about how, how likely injuries would occur from the hazard and how, how severe that would be try and consider as well the different types of severity you can look at so it could be damage to to property to goods to people um obviously you've got special considerations for, for expectant mothers and also young people as well. So just try and think how that would affect everybody. And then also, um, they've given this sort of a category of major. You don't have to do that. You can just you can just put high, low, or or medium. However, you you're more comfortable doing that. Okay. And this is how how effective will your action be? This is um, this is your opportunity to, to explain the action you've put into place and how that would work on the time scales and how that would fully control the risk. So again, you can see here, it doesn't need to be massively detailed, but if you just, if you think about what they're saying here, this is what they're looking for. You just need to give that information in there and just fully explain your, your thought process behind it. And that's it, so that's justification for one, then you just need to duplicate that for two and three. And then section four, um, so this is the opportunity to talk about how you would review and communicate. So this section here is quite, quite easy. Just be very careful when you're putting dates in. I would say 12 months is, is, is pretty standard for reviewing it. So an annual review of it. So I've had people refer when they've not put this, the year date in or they've accidentally put the wrong year in and, and they've been referred because of that, which is which is a bit of a shame. So just make sure you don't do that. And also the, um, and another thing you need to consider as well is for the risk assessment, when would you review it early? So if, you know, processes change, you know, new equipment, new staff that may be disabled or, um, or pregnant, you need to maybe just look at reviewing that early. So maybe try and put something in there about that as well. Okay, how the risk assessment findings will be communicated and who you need to tell. So obviously communication, as you know, from the content of the course is quite important. So, so everyone's on the same page with new control measures or new processes and safe systems of work. So you need to pop that in there. Um, obviously, 
In the NGU One book, it does go into detail about different types of communication, the pros and cons. So, how would you how would you do that? So it could be you know email, uh, you know meetings, training, that kind of thing. So you just need to think about how you would communicate changes, and and pop that in this section here. Okay, how you would follow up on the assessment and check the actions have been carried out. Uh, so this this would be. I mean, it's not just health and safety after every meeting, if there's actions agreed across multiple people, how in your organization would you normally keep track of that? It could be an electronic system or it could be um, regular meetings to, to follow up or someone maybe takes lead of that and, and chases the actions and, and their progress. So you just, however you would normally do that, you need to pop, pop that in this section here and just explain how how the actions would be followed up correctly to make sure that those are carried out and the changes are made to keep everyone safe. So that's it. So some very simple little tips there just to make sure you fully understand uh, what the markers are looking for. Um, and I think if you stick to those, uh, you should be fine. But if you need any more further guidance from me, my name's Richard, you can speak to your tutor or you can email me and uh, we can have maybe a one-to-one -one chat. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.